Hey everybody, so we have two special guests today, Lilith and Bess, and they are from Enterprise Knowledge. Fantastic people, very knowledgeable. They will be telling us how ontologies and knowledge graphs come together. They will actually be showing us how to actually do this. This is just one of many tutorials that we're going to be talking about on this channel. So check this one out and look for more. So with that, let's go see what they have to say. Hi everyone. My name is Luli Tasfaye. I'm a practice lead at Enterprise Knowledge for our data and information management practice. And I'm Beth Schrader. I'm a senior consultant in the data and information practice focusing on ontologies and knowledge graphs. Uh, when we are talking about semantic solutions, especially in the context of data and information management, it's really all about context, providing the business context behind your data and the ability to apply that knowledge, that business knowledge and context on your data across your disparate sources of content and platforms. This is how we look at the organizational maturity uh, when it comes to information and knowledge management. As we move further down uh, to the right, taxonomies, ontologies, and knowledge graph, we start getting a little bit more complex and start developing a maturity level that requires a little bit more thinking, uh, a little bit more detailed design and curation and governance, right? Typically, many of our clients are in the middle, starting with taxonomy. Traditionally, really taxonomy um, was is used as a way of organizing uh, topics. It is a form of standard uh, or controlled vocabulary that gives you the framework to control how your organization describes its content in a way that people relate to it and can easily find uh, what they're looking for and can easily apply it. A recent project uh, we completed designing the taxonomy for um, workforce matching um, or recruiting consulting company. Their need was to control how people describe um, their labels and their tags when it comes to talent, right, as a recruiting company. So by providing consistent options and labels for, you know, a controlled list of what falls under skill types, job roles, uh, required certifications, and the different job sectors and industries, we were able to design and align their vocabulary and their description of their talent to their overall solution offerings. Ontology takes it a little bit further uh, by providing you with that flexibility to add relationships, define relationships between those different entities that you have described. And here we're talking about those parent-child parent relationships that you are in ta your taxonomy allows you to define. Now we can map how they relate to one another. So Going back to the earlier example, for instance, uh, we have defined as part of their talent taxonomy, uh, the skills, the job roles and certifications. What ontology allows us to do is which job role uses the specific skills or needs the specific skills, right? And how it relates to that and what certifications apply to that, jobs, uh, that job role. And one key thing here is what ontology allows us to do is it gives us uh, a standard way to, uh, to build or design this data model or schema across our systems. But these uh, resource description framework type of standards allow us to apply our ontology across uh, multiple systems. And now we talk about uh, how do we apply it? How, do we, how does it apply to our content? And a knowledge graph is really the manifestation or the application of that ontology to your content. And a very popular use case is the Google knowledge graph. I, I would be able to see different things that are related to that uh, from different sources, right? Multiple sources that are not necessarily coming from, from one place. How is an ontology different from a knowledge graph? It is the application of your ontology to your data or to your content. You have your taxonomies defining uh, your hierarchy and your uh, classification, right? And now here on this slide, you see that if we say certificate is for a specific skill and a specific skill has, a specific job role has a skill, uh, what you see below the line uh, on that circle uh, is the actual data um, that that is the entity or the class uh, described by that ontology. So above the line, we have our ontological relationships that defines the relationships of our entities. And 
at the bottom, you see the actual data uh, being applied to our ontology, and that's your knowledge graph. Where do you store this, right? Because it, this may be a simple ontology, but the enterprise ontologies we work with and the knowledge graphs are really big and at a scale. So here's where a graph database comes into play. So a graph database, uh, there are multiple types, mainly property graphs and uh, triple stores. This is a triple uh, uh, version of that. This works in allowing us to store our knowledge graph in the form of triples, right? Subject, predicate, object, the way we talk in sentences in day-to-day -day life. So we see here we would have the scalability to store millions and trillions of rows of triples with their unique identifiers uh, to be able to uh, take our conceptual model, our ontology model, all the way to apply it to our data. How does it all fit this together? You see here that from at least the context of the organization, uh, this is important for different reasons. One, it gives the enterprise the ability to organize their data and aggregate data from di different sources, right? Now we have that semantic layer that would allow us to pull information without necessarily having to move it, uh, the, the right contextual information and organize it in such a way that it could streamline front end up for front end applications. It also serves as, uh, as a good bridge between, you know, the business users and the data uh, professionals, right? Uh, as you know, the data professionals are more focused on the left-hand side of our different systems and governance and managing those. On the front side, we have business users who would want to be able to interact with data the way they do on a day-to-day -day basis. These semantic layers help machines understand what we mean when we say product, for instance, for a specific company, because for a recruiting company, that's different than for a supply chain company. Um, so I come from a library science background. So our scenario here today is gonna be dealing with books. So here you'll see the raw data that we have. So I have uh, information about books. So I've got titles for books. I have authors for those books, um, some publishers. You'll see some books have multiple publishers publication years, uh, optionally sequels for certain books, um, and then topics. And you'll see most of these books have multiple topics as well. So the first step is gonna be to create our ontology. Um, so to do this, I'm gonna use a tool called Grapho. This is a, a free tool that you can really easily get started with. So we're trying to keep things fairly general at this level. Instead of looking at individual books, we wanna think about the concept of a book, um, making this a reusable framework. So I'm going to first create a, a class for books. Um, so if I go in here, I'll call this a book. And then I can also define attributes that books have. Um, so thinking back to our data, um, one thing that comes to mind is a title. So books have titles. All right. Um, I also want to think about authors, right? So books have authors. So I'll create an author class and maybe authors also have names. And I can create a relationship between them to reflect that books have authors. So while I'm creating this, I'm doing this in a visual interface, but it's actually creating um, URIs for each of these concepts. So if you click on one of these classes and you go into the advanced tab, you'll see that there's a URI here. Um, and you'll see that it uses this Grapho schema untitled EKG. Uh, I want to change that to give it a URI that's specific to my use case. So I'm going to come in here and go to my document properties and just change this document URI to maybe be uh, books. And once I submit that, it'll change the URIs in my document. So now you'll see uh, my URI here is books and it looks like I added an extra apostrophe or an extra slash. That's the beauty of doing this live. <laughs> So we'll just take that out. <laughs> and now we should be good. Yeah, books, author, books, book. So uh, to speed this up, you'll see this is our, it's still fairly simple, but this is a um, slightly more complete ontology that reflects our data. So we have books, which have authors, books have publishers, authors work with publishers, um, books have topics, and books can also have sequels, which are other books. Creating this ontology in this tool, we can do this uh, visually, but we can also export this as RDF, uh, the resource description framework. 
Um, so if I go in here, I can export this ontology as uh, OWL or a turtle file. I'm going to stick with turtle. And if I open this up, you'll see the underlying RDF data here. Um, so this is a, a turtle file that represents the ontology we just made visually. Um, so the reason we need to export this, if we want to create a knowledge graph, like Lily mentioned, we need somewhere to store that. It's you know great to draw bubbles on a PowerPoint slide, but if you want to query your data, if you want to be able to do anything with it, you need to store it in a graph database that can handle queries and inferencing. Um, so today I'm going to show you uh, using a tool called GraphDB. And one of the great things about GraphDB um, is that it has a, a free layer. So that's why I'm using it today to show you how you can get started really quickly here. Uh, so I've created a, a book repository in GraphDB and I'm actually going to import that ontology file we just exported. And I'll just go ahead and import that. So we're now loading our ontology into our graph database. And if we go to explore our data, you'll see that we have information about our ontology in here. So we have our, our book class here uh, defined as a class with the label book. So the next step is actually applying this ontology to our data. And the reason we want to do that is to build our knowledge graph. Uh, but using our ontology allows us to ingest this data we have in an Excel file right now in a standardized way, uh, creating triples that we can then query across to answer certain questions. So next, we want to upload our actual data. Um, so this is a tool in GraphDB called Ontofine that allows you to upload and transform tabular data. There are lots of ways you can get tabular data into an RDF format. Um, if you're a developer or programmer, you can write your own code to do this. There are lots of tools out there um, that will do this for you. This is just one tool that's easy to demo. Um, so first, I'm going to upload my Excel file. And this will upload my data for me and give me a preview here. This looks like what we saw in Excel. Um, it has some options here where you can uh, specify a header. Everything looks good, so I'm not going to mess with that. Um, and then we can create our project. And here we have the option to do some transformations and some cleaning before we uh, convert this into RDF. So one thing I'm going to do across the board is go in and trim some leading or trailing white spaces just to make sure that we didn't have a space in front of an author name um, that's going to create problems down the road. And then you'll see when we get to publisher, some of these books have multiple publishers. Um, so for example, the Harry Potter series has a UK publisher, a US publisher, and a Canadian publisher. Uh, and they're all separated by semicolon. So I'm actually going to come in here and split these um, based on that semicolon character. And you'll see now for every book, it's split out publishers onto separate rows. And now I'm going to go in and do the same thing, trim that uh, trailing leading white spaces. Gonna leave publication year alone, that looks great. Uh, for sequels, I'm just gonna do some trimming. So now our data has been um, fairly cleaned. At this point, we just need to get it into a triple format. So to do that, I'm gonna come up here to this RDF button, and this will help get it into the resource description framework. So I'm gonna start by making sure that I'm using uh, the URI that I use in my ontology. So if we pull our ontology back up, you'll see that in our ontology, we use this uh, book ontology prefix here. Uh, so I'm just going to copy that to make sure everything's consistent across the board. And I'll give this a prefix um, BD, maybe for book demo. And then I'm going to leave <laughs> the rest of this alone. So uh, once I do that, it generates this Sparkle query for me. Uh, if you're not familiar with Sparkle, um, it's a query language that you can use across uh, RDF data. It's similar to SQL for relational data. Um, it's based on pattern matching. We're not going to get into the specifics of how Sparkle works. Um, just know that this is a query that's automatically generated. We can use to preview our data. So what we have going on here is concept of a record. Uh, so every record corresponds to the original uh, rows we entered into. So one record should correspond to one book. Uh, but then once we did that cleaning and we split out publishers and topics onto different rows, a record might have multiple rows that actually connect to the data. Because we have some empty values. So not every book has a SQL um, is, is one. So in order to get around this, I'm going to make uh, most of these uh, relationships optional here. Okay, so now if we run this, uh, we got back 100 records. And then the rest of these, you'll see these relationships uh, actually match up to what we have in our ontology. So in our ontology, we had a relationship has author, has publisher, has publication year. Um, so, so these all match up to our ontology. So what we're doing right now is creating the framework to say for every row, take you know the, the value that was in the has author column and actually uh, make this relationship has author with that value. 
So now that I've been able to see this, I'm actually going to come over and switch to uh, generate a construct statement. So what this does is actually allows us to construct the triples that we want. Um, so again, I'm going to go through and do the same thing where I make these uh, relationships optional because I know that's uh, something we need to do based on our exploration. Now, there's a few things we need to take care of here. Um, because we're creating nodes or entities in our knowledge graph, we don't want our book or our title just to be a title. We don't want our author just to be an author name. We actually need to create URIs for each of these instances. Anything that corresponds to a uh, class in our ontology, anything that's an instance of a class needs to have a URI. You can see in the query that was automatically generated for us, they have this format that allows us to use our base URI. This is our, our BD prefix. Um, and then encode the string as our uh, URI ending. So this will encode, take whatever text we have um, and make sure we get rid of any spaces or characters that wouldn't be permitted in a URI that'll encode it for us um, and then spits out a URI. So depending on your use cases, you might need something a little different. You might want to use numbers instead of text or generate um, you know, a totally random UUID or, or hash code. Lots of options here. I'm going to stick with what they automatically generated for simplicity. Um, so you'll see for each record, uh, we want to take the title. And remember, our records correspond to books. And we're going to call this our book URI. And I'm going to keep doing this uh, for all of the entities that correspond to classes in our ontology. OK, so we have books, authors, publishers, topics, and sequels all have URIs. Um, publication year, we actually don't need to have a URI for. Um, so we skipped over this a little bit when we were creating the ontology. But uh, publication year is actually an attribute of our book. So our books have titles and publication years. This means it's only describing one entity. It's not creating a relationship between an entity and another entity. Um, so we don't need to create a URI for that. We're going to leave this as a, a literal object. OK, so now that we've done that, we need to come up here and actually create our triples uh, the way they should be according to our ontology. So we're going to start with the book. Um, so we created our book URI. And what we want to assert is that our book URI is a book. So that's the first thing. And then we've also, in our ontology, if we switch back over here, we've said that books have titles and publication years. So we're going to add those relationships in. OK. So the last thing we need to do here is actually create, um, I'm going to get rid of this, It's create the relationships that we defined in our ontology. So now we've taken all of our data. Uh, we've created URIs for the nodes in our ontology, and we've modeled it according to the ontology we set up. We should get back our data formatted as triples. So you can see here, um, again, because of the way we created our URIs, the default method here, we're actually encoding spaces. So that's what all these weird percent signs are. So not the prettiest to look at, but it is valid RDF. Um, so this is our book, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. It has author Arthur C. Clark. It's got a publisher, um, it's got topics. So this is all looking good. So the next step is to actually add it. So to do that, um, I'm going to go into uh, open the main Sparkle editor. So we just added 341 triples. Uh, so that's all of our data in an RDF format. And now we can actually start exploring it. So if we go over and look at our class hierarchy here, um, you can see here, I'll try to zoom in a little bit. These are our different classes. So this is what we set up in our ontology. So we have topics, we have books, we have authors, and over here we should have publishers. Great. So if we click on any of these, this is showing us all of the instances of books that we have in our data. So if the book, the class that's part of our ontology, now we've added in our data, we actually have a knowledge graph. So I can click on any of these, Pride and Prejudice. And this will take me to all the triples we have for Pride and Prejudice. So here we're seeing Pride and Prejudice. Um, it has various topics and it has a publisher. And so now we can start traversing our graph. So say we want to expand off of the topic England. Now we can see other books in our data set uh, that are about England to look for um, kind of the commonalities between these different entities. So we can see, you know, the uh, this Harry Potter book, um, you know, it has a sequel and has publishers. We can expand off of J.K. Rowling and see all the books that she wrote. Um, 
So this visual interface is really nice for being able to get an idea of, of what your data looks like. Um, and because we've ingested all of our data through our ontology, it's a standardized format that we can traverse and query against. But if you actually want to start answering questions that you have about your data, it's much easier to actually query it. So I made two uh, queries to just show uh, the power of this. So this one goes through and looks for all books that are written by JK Rowling and then looks at all of their topics so that we can see, you know, imagine you had a bigger library, you didn't just have a handful of books and you wanted to see, okay, every book that I have by this author, I wanna see the topics related to this author. So what this is allowing us to do is take our graph and kind of skip the book, um, go straight from the author to the topics. So you can see here all the topics we have um, attached to books that JK Rowling wrote. Uh, we can also go the opposite way and we can look at say, um, I wanna see all of the authors who wrote about the topic England. You can see I've got three authors in my data set. So obviously the bigger your knowledge graph is and the more complex the data is that you're modeling, um, the, the more complex questions you'll be able to ask and answer. So we just showed a really simple example of how you could take a small set of data and create an ontology to model it and then standardize it. Um, and even with that small data, you're able to see how uh, building a knowledge graph really quickly allows you to um, explore different relationships you might not have been able to see in a tabular format, especially when you have data at scale. Once you start getting into enterprise or, or government level data, um, that's not something you can just filter on an Excel spreadsheet. So putting your data into a knowledge graph really allows you to start to leverage your ontology um, and inferencing capabilities to find uh, hidden facts and patterns that you wouldn't have been able to see otherwise. Um, this also allows you to start to do some um, aggregation and reasoning across data, um, but they're really powerful for allowing you to combine structured and unstructured information, um, especially if you start factoring in things like machine learning, where you can create structure out of unstructured text and then um, store information that you gather in a knowledge graph that you can then query across. Um, you know, ontologies and knowledge graphs really provide a foundation for building strong um, artificial intelligence capabilities. But if you have any questions or need more information about, from an enterprise perspective, understanding your maturity level when it comes to that spectrum, uh, defining your specific solutions architecture or use, your use cases for uh, going down this path in this journey of building your semantic layer, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Let us know, reach out. And Again, I just want to thank Enterprise Knowledge for letting me work with two people that are fantastic at their company. And I have attended many different talks from many people from that company. They are fantastic. If you're looking for someone to help you with that, Go check them out. And with that, thank you for watching and I'll catch you next time.